Okay, so since you've been raised with Christ, seek what's above, verse 1. See that woman's eyes are turned upwards? She's looking at it. Seek what's above. So, teo is a Greek word much like the English word seek, with a wide, wide range of meaning. Its particular reference is to a person's will, perhaps, which can be directed, you can direct your will to profitable things or to unprofitable things. Direction of the will, seeking, what you're after. What are you after? Paul uses the present imperative, indicating that sustained effort is going to be required to go on seeking what's above. Because there's going to be plenty that pull you, pulls you towards seeking what's below. And earthly. But at this point, effort is required. The effort is required not to struggle with that sin. The effort is required to direct your mind to what's above. To seeking heavenly things. Now, I know the NIV says, set your mind on things above, but what it really says here is seek. Actively pursue to get hold of the things that are above. Invest in Heaven's Bank because it's not going to go bust. Seek the things that are above. These other things are going to go up in smoke. Seek what's above. Now, firstly, of course, Paul is speaking metaphorically of the heavens being up there, right? I'm not saying to you, heaven is up there. Was that first Russian space man in space? Can't remember the guy's name. Yuri Gagarin, was it? He said, I went to space and I didn't see God. Therefore, you know, there is no God by implication. Blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Rubbish. Okay, Paul is using a spatial metaphor to describe heavenly realities. And he's saying up there. To describe the two ages, you know. The present evil age and the age that is to come. Set your mind on that world that's coming. Where the answer lives, as opposed to where the problems live. The idea is that every good and godly thing is up there, whilst the realm of unspiritual, sinful things was on earth, hence worldly. So set your mind on things above, to Adam, as they tend to, um, the things above heavenly things. Set your heart, desire, seek heavenly things. Let me ask you a different question. Have you been seeking heavenly things at all this week? Well, after all, why would you? Well, for the reason Paul gives next, of course. Set up question. Why? Why seek the things above? Since you've been raised together with Christ, and it's where Jesus is seated. Since you've been raised with him. You've been raised together with Christ. No question about it, no shadow of doubt. It's a because. And this is really the counterpart to chapter 2, verse 20. Since you've died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why do you still submit to its rules? That's in chapter 2.20. There it is, since you died with him. Here it is, since you were raised from death together with him. Dying in his death, raised with him in his resurrection, and he's seated at the right hand of God. So, okay, how did you die with him? We saw back then. Repentance, faith, baptism, you died together with Christ. And because of what he did, atonement, justification, reconciliation, you've been raised together with Christ. Been united to him in his death and his resurrection. Symbolising baptism, and, and now you're living this new life. Seeking the things that are above. Since you were raised together with Christ, out of the sheer change of direction he's brought to you, through dying to that old way of life, being raised together with him, because of that sheer, sheer, sheer change of direction he's brought to you, well, out of that, he's brought to you gratitude for the life he's given you. And desire for the things that he's got for you. Seek and love. Seek. Set your mind on those things. We'll come to that shortly in verse 2. Why? Well, the fundamental reason is that that's where Jesus is. He's your life. If you're a Christian, he's your life. So you seek what's there with him. You seek him. If you're a Christian, you'd be overcome with the greatness about Jesus. I mean, the greatness of Jesus. He's great. Would you recommend Jesus to you at all? I mean, you know, most, most, most church people wouldn't, really. Looking at him, they wouldn't recommend him at all. We've got this thing on Facebook, haven't we? You know, there's a page, and you can recommend this page. By the way, that is a plug. Please, would you go and recommend the page? Because nobody has. If you go and have a look at the page and recommend it, right, that'd be nice. Um, but would you recommend Jesus? Think about it. 
the quality of your life following Jesus such that he would recommend it to somebody else to follow as an answer, as the way? If not, this needs attending to. Seek Jesus. Set your mind on seeking Jesus because that's where the one who is your life is. He's there in heaven, in heavenly glory. And, and it's where he is seated. Job done, sat down on the throne of God, ruling the universe, while we're surrounded by scenes of far lesser glory in this veil of tears, which presents itself every day to our senses. Seek that. Wouldn't you very much want to fix your gaze on what's there? Wouldn't you want to seek that? Now, I don't know about you, I need incentivizing. Do you need incentivizing? Um, I get up of a Monday, particularly of a Monday, right? And I've got this list of jobs, is that true? <laughs> And, you know, it can become quite overwhelming, can't it? Isn't it? I've got to do this lot today. Certainly after the weekend, it seems like there's a list of things that have got to be done. And it really helps a lot to just say, when I've done all that, I'm going to do this. Do you know what I mean? This is where I'm going. This is what I'm heading for. This is going to be great. And Paul is saying, hang on. You're living here in this veil of tears. We're sometimes being a Christian quite costly. I mean, for us, we feel it's costly. Imagine what it would be like if we were in some closed country somewhere with our small kids or whatever. Yeah, we can't begin to imagine it coming. It feels costly. But look what's there. Look what it's getting you. Look what's at the end of this. Fix, fix your minds there. Set your mind on these things. Seek that which is above. And when I'm in a situation where I've just got to knuckle down and get on with something I don't want to do, I really respond to be able to look forward. Paul has said, look forward. Look forward to something else that lies ahead of you that you can look forward to when the nasty stuff is over and done with. Since you've been raised together with Christ by virtue of what he's done, seek the things that are above where he is seated, reassurance there of his job done, at the right hand of God. That's what you go for. That's what you seek. That's what you're after. That's what you're looking for. Well, actually... That's not all there is in this verse. There's a strong emphasis on determined continuation in this seeking. But then Paul takes it a little further in verse 2. Seek, yeah, but also set your mind on what's above. First it's about what you're looking for, seek what's above. Second it's about what you're looking at. Set your mind on the things above. Remember what Jesus asked his disciples about who people said he was? I'm thinking of Mark chapter 8. Do you remember that? Some people say John the Baptist, some people say Elijah, some people say one of the prophets. Who do you say I am? says Jesus. You're the Messiah. Well done, Simon Bar Jonah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he started talking to them about all the things that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected by man, and cast out. And Peter took him on one side and said, Lord, surely not to rebuke him. And Jesus said, Can't you behind me say why? Because your mind is on the things of earth, not on the things of God. What made Jesus turn to Peter and call him Satan? His mind was on the things of earth, not on the things of heaven. And that puts you on the old Knicks team. The difference between a faithful follower of Jesus and Satan seems to be, according to Jesus in Mark 8, whether you have your mind set on the concerns above or on earthly things. That's how important the issue that Paul is addressing here is. Set your minds on things above. Sounds pretty like verse 1, of course. It's quite a different word that gets used here. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above. I've got to tell you, it's, it's a misleading translation there in the English, because hearts and minds are pretty specific ideas in English, as if you're setting your emotions and then setting your intellect. No, it's not that in the original at all. That is completely misleading. Um, don't go with that. It's just set your mind on things above. For later, consider. Consider. And Brian says it's rather a neutral term. It's about thinking, considering, judging, generally giving one's mind to in the most broad of senses. Not so much what you're looking for as what you're looking at. What do you think about? Ooh, don't answer that question. I don't want to know. What do you think about as you go about your daily life? What's going on in there? Because this is true, isn't it? As you're pottering around your laboratory or your library, 
Jim. Um, as you're pottering about the place, doing your work, your mind's doing stuff, isn't it? As you're still waiting for the bus, and as you're driving the car down the road, your mind's doing things, what's it doing? What's interesting is a hole in the hedge. Paul is saying, take those minds of yours that are always running, and set them running on something else. Set them running on the things above, but Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Not simply an act of the intellect, of course, this from the oldest word, a movement of the will. It's got to do with aims and motives underlying them, because your mind, your personality, your character runs on the thoughts that are normally taking place inside that cranium. The thoughts that are going on there form the character and the personality out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Says Jesus. Now remember, the direction of travel of Paul's thought is away from a heresy filled, this worldly pattern of thought and sinful, chaotic life that gets spawned out of those things towards a heavenly things above where Jesus is, new world of thought and the ordered, disciplined, sanctified life that this pattern of thinking creates. There is no doubt that the thoughts that go round in your head will issue, will emanate forth, emanate forth, I'm tired, the words are getting quite big. It's going to spew out into your life and the way you live and the personality and the character that you manifest in the world where God has put you. It's an admonition to be heavenly minded, not earthly minded, along with all the things that brings along with it. Now, Paul is not saying, Oh Lord, heavenly, high and mighty thoughts. Like, don't go there. You know that ain't right, don't you? But he is saying, Let your mind run on the things of God, and it will determine and help in your living for Him. Set your minds on things above, and everybody's going to do this. And every secular commentator in the media and in the press and what they Yes, that's nice. We want, we want our religious people to be basically good and godly, because that's rather a good thing. And you've stated a positive. Set your mind on earth. Yes, we need earthly-minded clerics. Yes, absolutely. And Christians as well, as long as they don't bring it to work. So, set your minds on earthly things and positive. Whoa, 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 not on earthly things. On heavenly things, not on earthly the negative comes into play straight away. Set your mind on things that are above, that's great. No one objects because they don't have the full picture yet. If you're going to do this, then you are not going to do that. Hang on. There's a restriction in place. Obviously, really, that a world so committed to the compromised task of having its cake and eating it, the picture hasn't been grasped and the positive requirement is asserted, but seven shades of protest break out when you assert the negative.